Michael Rosenblum was born in 1954, to Barbara and Maurice Rosenblum of Pittsburgh's Shadyside neighborhood. By his late teens, Michael began using drugs and alcohol heavily, which led to trouble with the law, and a fear of the police on his part. He often fled, at one point leading police on a car chase, and sometimes violently resisted arrest. Between 1974 and 1980, Pittsburgh police had arrested him three times on traffic violations, including driving while intoxicated, and drug possession. Eventually, Maurice confiscated his son's car. The Rosenblums took action to help Michael get clean. Maurice determined that his son's problems had begun in earnest after Michael had made the acquaintance of a doctor, near the family's Jersey Shore summer home in Beach Haven, who wrote the boy, hundreds of prescriptions for drugs whenever he called. After Maurice approached the New Jersey Governor Brendan Byrne, the New Jersey Attorney General's office opened an investigation, and the doctor eventually surrendered his license to avoid criminal charges. Michael also went to several different rehabilitation clinics, including the nearby Western Psychiatric Institute. While on a 28-day stay at the Western, between 1979 and 1980, he met 30-year-old Lisa Scherer, a former Playboy bunny from Baldwin, who had an arrest record of her own. Michael, whom friends recalled had always easily attracted women due to his charm and intelligence, became romantically involved with Lisa, who was estranged from her second husband, by the time both were released. According to his father, Michael had been too impatient to finish college. So Maurice gave him a job, selling insurance at his brokerage. He told Michael that if he really wanted to live well and drive his car, he would have to work for it. Michael had only recently gotten out of the Western Psychiatric Institute, when he got a speeding ticket in Pittsburgh. On the night of February 13, 1980, his mother Barbara, happened to find a bottle of pills in his room, which was the tipping point for the Rosenblums as they were very patient with him until then. The mother and son began arguing, and she finally told him to leave the house, and to not come back until he's clean. Furious, Michael stormed out of the house, and went straight to Lisa, who at the time was applying for a waitressing job at a nightclub. The couple went back to Lisa's adoptive mother's house in Whitehall, where Michael took a concoction of pills. On the morning of February 14th, Michael woke up with what can only be described as a bad drug hangover, and he seemed to drift, in and out of consciousness. Lisa was worried about Michael, so she took him to the local hospital at 10 a.m., and urged him to check himself in, to which Michael flatly refused. After deciding to go back to his parents' house, Michael asked Lisa to drive him there. Along with Lisa's three-year-old daughter, the couple set off to the Rosenblum house. On their way, Lisa realized that she had driven over a curb while entering Homestead, and decided to pull into a gas station to get out and see if she had gotten a flat tire. Apparently angry at Lisa's reckless driving, Michael got into a heated argument with her, one which prompted the gas station attendant to call the police. But before the police arrived, Michael decided he would drive, and as soon as he got into the driver's seat, he reversed, and slammed into a telephone pole's guy wire. Before Lisa could resume the argument, he ordered her and her daughter, out of the car. Michael told Lisa to meet him at his parents' house and simply drove off. The mother and daughter, instead, hitchhiked to Oakland, where Lisa checked herself into the West Penn Hospital's psychiatric ward. Michael had left the gas station at 11.35 a.m. on February 14, and no one had seen or heard from him again. No one knows what happened to Michael, but what happened to Lisa's car is undisputed. In less than an hour after Michael took off from the gas station, Lisa's Pontiac Sunbird was reported as abandoned in the westbound lane of East Carson Street, also known as River Road, located in an uninhabited area of Baldwin. At 12.24 p.m., Two borough police officers, Chester Lombardi and Robert Weber, arrived on the scene. Lombardi and Weber noted that the vehicle's engine was cold, and its keys were missing. Both left side tires were shredded beyond repair, the vehicle had apparently been running on its rims after the tires were damaged. The officers noticed the car was filled with an assortment of items, including hundreds of photographs, too many to sift through, as Weber later recalled. After identifying the vehicle's owner as Lisa Scherer, the officers called the station to request a tow. While Lombardi and Weber waited for the tow truck, another Baldwin officer, Sergeant Thomas Morse, drove by. 
Morse asked them what they were doing, and after they told him that they were waiting for the truck, he drove off. The truck arrived shortly after, and took the car to a nearby garage where the Baldwin police kept impounded vehicles. The car would remain there for over three months. Lisa was not informed that her car was impounded, and so she assumed that Michael was still missing, along with her car. Lisa called Barbara on the morning of February 15th, and told her that Michael had not returned. While Maurice believed he would return within a day or two, or call within that time, Barbara feared that harm had befallen Michael. She immediately called the Pittsburgh police and reported him missing. Captain Teresa Rocco, head of the Pittsburgh Police Department's Missing Persons Unit, immediately began a search, focusing on finding the car first, eventually she would reach out to police in every state and major city. Officers throughout the city and in every suburban department, including Baldwin, were alerted to the car's license plate number. Maurice began his own search after two weeks of police effort came up empty, calling old friends of his sons as far away as California, to see if Michael had gone there. He put up money for a reward for information that would close the case, and took time off from his business to distribute flyers. Three months later, the search for Lisa's car finally ended. Officer Morse called Lisa to let her know that her car would be salvaged if she does not come collect it. Understandably shocked, Lisa called Captain Rocco, and let her know that her car had been found. Rocco, along with two city detectives and Maurice Rosenblum, went straight to Baldwin Police's chief, Aldo Gabbari. Baldwin Police records showed that the Sunbird had been at the garage since the day Michael had disappeared. Rocco demanded to know why Lisa had not been told this, even though the car had been traced to her. Gabbari told them he personally had not known the car was there until that day, but said his department had indeed sent her a letter the following day, but that it had probably burned in a mailbox fire, an explanation that seemed too convenient and suspicious. A week later, Baldwin police produced a letter to Lisa from their archived files, which was dated February 15th. Lisa maintained that she never received the letter. The official police record of the car's towing had a notation scrawled on it, Gallagher notified Aunt, referring to Patrick Gallagher, the dispatcher on duty that day, and Aunt referring to Lisa's non-existent Aunt. The handwriting was later found to be Gabarese. In a story published by the Pittsburgh Press in June about the case, a photograph of Lisa used for the story was taken from one of the albums in her car. The album was missing from her car when it was returned to Lisa. The reporter, Noreen Heckman, who wrote the article, claimed that she received most of the information in the story, and the photograph, from Gabarese. An interdepartmental memo also said that Baldwin officer Warren Cooley gave her additional information. Both he and the chief later testified that they had had no knowledge that Sharer Sunbird was in the police impound lot, much less visited it, during the three months it was there. These two events of dubious nature are what pushed Maurice to conclude that the Baldwin Police Department was hiding the truth about his son's disappearance. The day after Captain Rocco questioned Chief Gabbari about Lisa's car, the area around River Road where the car was discovered back in February, was searched. Searchers, largely drawn from the borough's volunteer fire department and the county police, spent three hours looking over a very small area in the immediate vicinity, between the road and the river. They were assisted by scuba divers that Maurice Rosenblum had hired to look in the river, and a helicopter a client had loaned Maurice which searched from the air. Skippy Dobson, one of Baldwin's police officers, along with other searchers asked Gabbari if they could expand the search further downstream or on the south side of the road, a wooded area with several ravines. Gabbari refused to allow them to do so, claiming that Maurice Rosenblum had wanted only the smaller area searched. A week later, Gabbari called Rocco and told her that Michael was still alive, and that he's now wanted in relation to a drugstore robbery that had recently taken place. Rocco, however, was skeptical of this assumption. Records stated that Baldwin officer Warren Cooley had created a facial composite of the suspect the day after the crime. The image closely resembled the one of Michael Rosenblum on the many flyers his father had handed out and posted all over the Pittsburgh area. There was no information on the composite itself to indicate when it was made, or by whom. Also, the witnesses had described the robber as wearing outsized mirrored sunglasses, but the composite did not depict them. 
It seemed as though the Baldwin Police Department was trying hard to pin the crime on Michael. Because when Rocco and Maurice went to the drugstore and showed the witnesses photos of Michael, they did not recognize him. They also learned that Cooley had not spoken with an important witness who had seen the getaway car. In mid-July, Noreen Heckman, the reporter from Pittsburgh Press, called Barbara Rosenblum and told her that an arrest warrant for Michael was being issued by the Baldwin police for the drugstore robbery, and that she would be writing a piece on the same. Barbara who was still distraught over her son's disappearance, was now suddenly forced to face this extremely unsavory situation. She immediately called Captain Rocco, who in turn called Gabari to ask for an explanation. But when Maurice approached the press about this new development in the case, Gabari withdrew the arrest warrant and the story was cancelled. Gabari later said that he withdrew the warrant out of respect for the Rosenblums, but Rocco suspected that it was nothing more than a failed attempt to mislead the investigation. Rocco was able to find a suspect who more accurately fit the description given by the witness, in the Butler Jail north of Pittsburgh. He eventually confessed to the robbery. Records showed later that the Baldwin police had done nothing else to investigate the robbery between April and July. After the fiasco surrounding the drugstore robbery, no further leads on the case emerged. For the next two years, Maurice spent all his time and effort in following up on leads from all over the country. He increased the size of the reward, and bought billboard space near the site where the sunbird was found. He even consulted supposed paranormal mediums and psychics, and got permission to have a trap placed on Scherer's phone. Maurice received anonymous phone calls at home on two separate occasions. Both calls were made on the first and second anniversaries of Michael's disappearance. And both times, the caller told Maurice that Baldwin police had arrested Michael, and hung up without identifying themselves. Unfortunately, nothing significant came of these phone calls. In the seven years since Michael's disappearance, three of the officers involved in the case had mysteriously died of heart attacks. Lombardi, who had responded to the abandoned car, Patrick Gallagher, the dispatcher who had been recorded as notifying Scherer's non-existent aunt the day afterwards that the car had been towed, and Morse, the officer who drove past Michael's car on the day of his disappearance. As for Lisa Scherer, she had since gotten divorced from her estranged second husband, and married for a third time. She left the Pittsburgh area with her husband and daughter a few years later in response to a bomb threat. Her family did not know where she had gone, saying she was off the map, possibly having returned to her former home in Florida, or in Baltimore. Rosenblum's investigators were, conveniently, unable to find her. After lobbying for other law enforcement agencies at higher levels of the government to get involved, Maurice managed to get the county police to start an investigation into Michael's disappearance. But after some minimal early efforts, they lost their files. In December 1986, the Rosenblums received another anonymous tip, that yielded information which confirmed Maurice's view, that the Baldwin police had been actively obstructing the investigation of their son's disappearance. A letter signed by a concerned friend, sent to their home told them this, and suggested they would find proof if they spoke to Margaret Hazlitt, a former state trooper who had worked as a dispatcher for the Baldwin police after retiring. Maurice drove straight to Lakeville, Massachusetts, where she had moved, to talk with her. Hazlitt told Maurice that on the day Lisa's car had been found to have been in Baldwin's impound lot, Gabri had been in a rage. She had been at work, and saw the chief order Fred Capelli, the department's clerk, to type up a letter to Scherer saying that her car had been recovered, backdated to February 15th, and put it in the file to allow the police to claim it had been sent. She had not told either of the other investigations because she was afraid that she and Capelli would get fired, and because they had never asked about the letter. Soon after his visit to Massachusetts, Maurice contacted a longtime friend, State Representative K. Lee Roy Irvis, and told him what he had learned. Irvis then took it up the chain of command, and the case was finally referred to the State Police's Bureau of Criminal Investigation. They talked to Capelli, who not only confirmed Hazlitt's account but added that Gabari had told him to forge Lombardi's signature on the letter, after Lombardi refused to sign it. At first, things seemed to be going in the right direction. The investigation by the state police revealed other criminal activities related to the Baldwin Police Department, and it looked like a trial would take place soon. But things suddenly changed, 
when the lead investigator from the state police told Maurice that it would be better for Gabri to retire than to face charges. And later that year, the case was dropped without any reason stating why. In July 1987, before the state investigation had been dropped, Maurice wrote to Baldwin's Borough Council and stated that they should investigate what he believed was a cover-up. The council heeded Maurice's advice, and opened an investigation and held a hearing. Solicitor John Luke, being a close ally of Gabary, pressured one of the deposed witnesses to claim that Gabary was not involved in any cover-up. But another Baldwin police officer, George Golovich, who was accused of writing the backdated letter to Lisa Scherer's non-existent aunt, maintained that there was high-level corruption in the Baldwin Police Department. Golovich would later be subjected to wrongful termination because of his statements about the Baldwin PD. A majority of the council believed the charge against Gabari had been proven, and voted 5-2 to, to fire him in early October. He appealed to the Borough Civil Service Commission, three of whose five members were his close personal friends. At the end of the year, the commission voted to overturn the firing, and reinstate Gabari. And so, the long and exhausting investigation came to a fruitless end with only one officer from the Baldwin PD being reprimanded. Private Detective Stephen Tursack, a retired veteran of the Pittsburgh Police who had worked for Rocco during the 1980 investigation, worked for Baldwin's Borough Council. Tursack came to believe that Michael Rosenblum had, as he had done on other occasions, fled when police attempted to pull him over, to the point that they might have responded by running the sunbird off the road. Michael in turn might have attempted to fight the officers, and they beat him to death in retaliation and then disposed of the body. Some of the Baldwin PD officers agreed with private detective Stephen Tursack's take on events that transpired on the day of Michael's disappearance. They thought it likely that someone like Officer Cooley would resort to violence against a fleeing suspect. They claimed that Cooley was a violent man, and at the time, he was also facing a civil suit from two unnamed residents, alleging he had attempted to extort money from them. Pittsburgh Magazine ran a cover story and editorial about the case in its May 1988 issue, recounting everything that had happened up to Gabari's reinstatement. The month after the story was published, Cooley and another officer Misenik, sued the magazine's publisher, Harger, Golovich, and Tursack, for libel. They alleged the story contained false statements and recklessly implicated them in Rosenblum's disappearance, and that Harger personally had defamed them in a radio interview about it. The magazine defended the story and Harger called the allegations ludicrous. In 1990, Cooley and Misenik settled on the day the case was to go to trial for an amount agreed to be between $50,000 and $75,000. In January, 1989, the NBC television network aired a segment of Unsolved Mysteries which included interviews with both Maurice and Barbara Rosenblum, Tursack, Hazlitt, Capelli, and Thomas McFall of the Borough Civil Service Commission, and reenactments of events such as the discovery of the sunbird on the stretch of River Road. After the program ended, a man who did not identify himself called the program's hotline from somewhere in the state of Washington, and said that he had been held in the Baldwin police lockup on the night of Michael Rosenblum's disappearance. He recalled that Michael had also been held in lockup, and had a gunshot wound to his leg and other injuries suggesting a beating, later, officers came and took him to what the caller presumed would be a hospital. Maurice Rosenblum, who by then had raised the reward to $25,000 and had come to believe that Michael was dead, told the media he would attempt to find the caller. The Baldwin police said that there were no detainees in the lockup that day, and reiterated that they had no knowledge of Michael's whereabouts. In April 1988, a bone fragment and some scraps of clothing were found in the woods, where the sunbird had been recovered eight years earlier. At first, the bones were thought to be human, they were later positively identified as those of an animal. Although the corduroy and shoe sole found, were consistent with the clothing Michael Rosenblum was wearing when Lisa saw him drive off. As a result of this discovery, in late 1989, Maurice Rosenblum filed a petition to have his son declared legally dead. The petition was granted in early 1990, almost 10 years after Michael had last been seen. Two years later, in April 1992, a hiker in the woods further down the Monongahela, in the 40 acres that Gabari had kept the searchers from looking in, found a fragment of a human skull. In June, 
the county coroner's office confirmed it was Michael Rosenblum's. Maurice noted that it was found on the same day he received the headstone he had ordered, for what was to be an empty grave. The cause of Michael's death could not be determined, but the family vowed to continue investigating. I knew what the answer was for many years, Maurice said. Who knows where it will go tomorrow? Sadly, Michael's father, Maurice Rosenblum, died in 2008. And police chief Aldo Gabari passed away in 1997, at the age of 76. Michael Rosenblum's case remains unsolved to this day. If you have any information regarding the case or would like to share your opinions, let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching and we hope you found our video interesting. Like, comment and subscribe for more fascinating unsolved mysteries.